there are four 100 picofarad caps in the IF chain. So one right after the converter, between the first and second, second and third, and third and detector stages. So I started checking them. This one checks fine. Uh, this one seems to be a little low in value. It's also a different brand than the others, which is a bit odd, and I haven't checked that one yet. But the one in here, I completely removed to make sure I was really getting a good connection on my capacitor tester. And it is not healthy. So when I rock this dial, I should get a nice strong wedge open, and I just get a little kind of faint smudge around the 100 picofarad mark. Doesn't show any leakage though. But by way of comparison, it should look like that. When uh, it is uh, good. So I'm going to hook up a brand new mic cap and show you how that tests. So, brand new 100 picofarad 500 volt mic cap. Incidence on that, and we get full deflection right on the 100 mark. I hope you guys can see that. that is, camera has trouble with eye tubes. My viewfinder looks like it's a completely saturated green donut, but uh, there is actually a big uh, wedge right in here. So. That is not a healthy cap. That is going to get replaced. And if you're wondering how to read these, there was some variation from brand to brand, but basically starting in the upper left-hand corner, we got a brown, then we got a black, then we got a black. So that is one, zero, zero. It's just like the resistor color code. Bottom left is green. That's 500 volts. The other two, I don't quite remember. Uh, tolerance, I think. Uh, so, uh, I got one more to check right there. That is another 100. So three of them out of the four were this brand, which is solar. And this guy, I believe, is, yeah, it's an Aerovox. Uh, that one measures a bit low. This one measures a bit high. I haven't checked that one yet. I'm kind of inclined to just go ahead and replace all of them. Also spot checked a few others, and none of them have shown leakage. All of them are off a little bit in value. And there are quite a few. And by the way, you don't have to replace these with mica. For example, some of these are a little bit larger, like 2,000 picofarad. You could use a plastic film cap. They are quite temperature stable, maybe not quite as good as mica, but pretty good. Uh, but another option is C0G or NP0 type ceramic, um, which costs uh, quite a bit less than mica. Mica caps are getting a little bit harder to find, and they can, when you get to the larger values, like 2,000 picofarad, that could be a 5 or even a $10 capacitor. So. Uh, something to keep in mind. C0G and NP0 have a zero temperature coefficient. They don't drift with temperature, which is a problem with most ceramic type caps. But like giant ones like this, uh, modern ones would be are uh, a little bit pricey. Well, I'm on the topic, something that confused me when I had this set up, right side up, and I was adjusting the horizontal stuff. I was confused because there are two adjustments back here. Uh, I think every other TV I've ever worked on has one horizontal coil. This has two, and a trimmer cap for the horizontal drive. I haven't read up on the theory of how this works, but here are those two coils. And there's that big mica cap, it's a 4700. Yeah, that would be pretty expensive to replace. Uh, so this is not the standard synchro glide type circuit. This is a little bit more complicated. Um, I'm used to seeing just maybe this, like a ringing coil, or just this, but not not too in concert like that. So with, after I fiddled around with it, 
I seriously doubt these are adjusted right. This one was pretty much driven all the way in when I got the set like it is now. This one I backed off a bit. I think in the service info they do describe how those should be adjusted somewhere, so I'll have to go through that procedure. But back to this topic, let's check this cap. And if I got enough hundred hundreds on hand, uh, I replace them all, but first for sure we'll replace that one. I'll tack the other ones back into the circuit. And here's that fourth one being tested. It seems to be good, but um, off in value. It's more like 85 rather than 100. So, uh, not the most precise mica caps. I don't know if they drift in value with age or they just weren't made that well to begin with. I believe what happens, you can kind of see it on this with that one lead. Um, if the leads bend and flux, they can break the seal and air can get in there and um, silver oxidizes. And I think that's what alters the value and can cause leakage. Finished going through and checking all the mica caps in the IF and there was just the one that was bad between the second and third stage. Um, and replacing that improved performance a bit and sync got a little more stable. Now I got to read up on the theory of operation because I'm not familiar with this alignment technique. I don't know how critical those capacitor values are. If they're just coupling a cap being plus or minus 20% I don't think would matter. If they do work in conjunction with those tunable inductors then yeah, if the value has changed it would definitely throw the alignment off. If it does I should go ahead and replace all those 100 picofarad caps and realign the set. I hope I don't have to. So after that I went through and checked all the resistors and probably not coincidentally I found that R251, the 470 ohm resistor, was bad. It measured about 200 ohms. And upon visual inspection, discovered that it was split. So it looked like it cooked uh, and failed. Perhaps because that capacitor started conducting more and um, caused more current to flow through that resistor. So that has been replaced. It is that new resistor right down there. And again, things improved a bit. Not tremendously, but small incremental improvements. So I'm going to read up on the alignment theory on this. Meanwhile, those ver really bright vertical lines, there's two of them on the left side of the CRT, and the horizontal linearity is horrible. I want to tackle that next. Uh, I checked the tubes in here, horizontal output tube and damper both test like new. So this. I don't like that one of these is all the way in and one is quite far out. And I don't like the fact that this drive capacitor is really mounted off center. It's, um, it's almost impossible to adjust it. And actually adjusting it doesn't seem to do a whole lot of anything. And it's mounted strangely. Uh, screw on this side and nut on the other. And that screw head is kind of mangled. And since it doesn't line up right, it makes me think that this has been monkeyed with. Except that the solder joints look like all the others where they've got that dot of red uh, clear coat. Which I think was a factory thing to verify the connection had been made or inspected and this whole area's got it which makes me think it's original could it have been just a sloppy manufacturing job I don't know it looks to me like that bracket if it was bent to be more of a square or right angle rather than oblique then the hole will line up better so maybe it just got mushed down um so I want to inspect that. 
and see if the capacitance does actually vary as it's adjusted. Check that resistor. Check these mica caps and read up on how these are supposed to be adjusted to do their thing. So horizontal drive should very much affect the horizontal linearity and uh, hopefully eliminate those two vertical bright lines. This controls how much signal is fed into the grid of the horizontal output tube, which is right here. Here's a little progress update on the horizontal area. I did not find any smoking guns. No obviously bad parts. I did unmount the drive trimmer capacitor and put on a capacitance bridge and it does have the correct range from fully open to fully closed. The bracket was bent. I did straighten it out as best I could and now it lines up pretty well with the hole so I'll be able to adjust it more easily. Uh, it's a little loose but uh, we'll give it a try. The other thing I determined is that like most of this set it's really hard to tell what's going on because of the way they built this thing. So uh, after poking and prodding and clipping out one lead of every mica cap did not find anything that was really bad but what I did decide to do was simplify things a little bit. For example there was this huge 4700 picofarad mica cap across this flywheel coil, uh, ringing coil, whatever you want to call it. So I replaced it with that little guy which is a C0G type ceramic cap. That's the type that is very temperature stable and the capacitance does not vary with the applied voltage. Likewise, that was a 390 picofarad big mica cap. Now it's that little guy. And just for stability's sake, I've been replacing some of the resistors too with uh, more temperature stable type. And here there had been two 3 mag 1 watt resistors in uh, parallel, which would make 1.5 mag. 1 watt each, so they would have 2 watts of power dissipation. However, there's nowhere near that kind of voltage across it. Here it is in the schematic, and they do show two, three megs in parallel. It's good going between grids on two tubes. They don't show the voltage, but the difference cannot be all that much. So there's no way they did that for power handling capability. I'm guessing they did it for precision. Notice they're 5% which at the time was about as good as you could get. Uh, but by putting two in parallel, they could select them at the factory to get exactly the value they wanted. So say one was a little bit high, they could select another one that was a little bit low and put them in parallel to get exactly 1.5. So what did I do? I just replaced it with a 1.5. It's only a half watt, but I think it'll work out just fine. I noticed that in some other areas as well, like down here there's a 3K on one side, which is an odd value, on the other side is an 8.2K, and they're in parallel. I'm guessing that's to get the value they needed. Also noticed, there's a gigantic 75K 2 watt resistor, 5% on this side. In fact, there's a, most of the resistors in this area are 5%. They're off a little bit, not that much, but check out how much smaller a modern 2 watt resistor is. So I'm going to put it in there, partly because these are more temperature stable, the modern equivalent, but also it frees up space and I can see what the heck is going on. There's so many of these big mica caps and so many large resistors, it's hard to verify the wiring. So I'm going to put this one goes right down in there. Uh, and I replace a few other parts. Uh, and then I'm going to button this up and give it another try. That drive control should have a profound impact on the horizontal linearity and the high voltage output, which should affect the brightness. 
so we got to get that working properly I was cleaning off this lug in preparation for installing the new 75k resistor when I noticed something a little puzzling there were the remains of a component lead so I took off the 75k resistor lead and there was another lead underneath it that had been clipped off everything else is accounted for I don't know what the heck that was for but it is near these lugs which have nothing on them when I got the set but clearly did at some point and they were clipped off and they've got the factory seal of approval red lacquer on them so something was here at some point and it may very well have gone from here over to there what the heck is going on one thing I can possibly think of is on the schematic they note it's a 6.8k resistor going there with a dashed line it potentially was going to pin 8 of the horizontal output tube that is way over here uh, let's see and there's a wire it goes around around and it goes there is it right does that make sense oh yeah that's the 265 volt bus okay that's a really odd way of saying that there was a resistor between the 265 volt bus and that point hmm so perhaps at some point there was a 6.8k resistor from here to there and a wire from there to there. And there's a symbol on here. Circle with a star. Oh, that's a triangle with a star. Ah. C327. Connect is indicated by dotted lines. One. C334 and R337 added. So I was saying that and some revision was added. Oh, and this cap was added. Huh. So maybe that's maybe those parts were here at some point and somebody took them out. C334 and R337, but where is C327? Well, that is something to try, is to put those components in. Um, <laughs> I'll look through the other pages of the service notes to see why that was there in some revisions. It'd be nice if they had said why it was there. Oh, there's C3, C327. Oh, so that's the high voltage filter cap, 500 picofarad, 20,000 volt doorknob cap off the high voltage rectifier. So I was saying in some versions, it goes to a tap on the flyback. In some revisions, the other end goes to, well, ground. And they're saying when it is going to ground, these extra parts are added. Hmm. Interesting. So maybe at some point that high voltage cap got replaced or rewired and they clipped out those other two parts. Well, it's plausible. It would explain why uh, the stuff looks the way it does. Hmm. Because the resistor could have gone here and the capacitor could have gone there, I believe. Yes, that's exactly how it would have gone. Or could have gone. Huh. It turns out that the drive control does do something. It probably did before too, but it was just so hard to get at. Um, but it only does it when it's very tight or just slightly backed off a little bit. Once you start backing off a few more turns, it just doesn't really seem to do anything. So there's like a 
a quarter turn from fully tight to just backing off a little, but it actually does do something. It does affect the linearity a bit. So I think that is actually working correctly. So what else have we got? This is a bit complicated, more complicated than later sets. Uh, the problem with these early designs is they hadn't quite worked everything out yet. So, well, we've got a horizontal size and a linearity. I've not tried touching either of those. Those are these two shafts extending out here to coils uh, underneath there. Now, here's another curious thing. While uh, checking out things topside, there's one cap here. Uh, if you guys can see it up here, one of the legs had broken loose. Reattaching it made no difference whatsoever. And that is this guy on one side of the linearity control. I have not checked continuity in these two coils. So we can do that. But something else, uh, I haven't done anything inside the box. Other than test these tubes. However, experience tells me that these tubes can be a little... Um, subjective. I mean they can test great on a tester but in the set they might not perform quite up to snuff especially the horizontal output tube. So I want to try swapping these out. So 19BG6 tested like new and I don't see much sign of wear on it. It's a GE. I'm sure it's not the original else what would have been quite a bit discolored assuming it saw some use. I think I got some I think I got one or two uh, spares. And this guy, the damper tube, I want to swap out. Oh, there's not a whole lot in here. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. Damn, what do you know? There is a cap I totally missed. And two resistors in parallel. What are those? Those are 470K, so two in parallel would be, well, half of that, so two... 35 or so. So where are those? Is that that? They only show a single 470k. Hmm. What are they going to? Uh, one side is going to the cap on the horizontal output tube. So it's got to be these guys. But they only show a single 470. Interesting. Well, for sure we're going to replace this, because that definitely will have a profound effect on this. Should have checked sooner. Should have looked inside here sooner. Uh, I just didn't want to monkey with this stuff, because I uh, still have not dealt with that repair. Everything in here is a little, eh. That's, that's resistor has seen better days, too, as this high, this high voltage lead. All these wires are a bit brittle. And there's one part here, I think, that's a ceramic cap. Weird, really weird, because the only thing it's going to are two wires down below. So why the heck didn't they mount it down below? <sighs> Unless that was something that they had to tune like after the set was assembled. Um, I want to check what that's going to, but I kind of thought I had accounted for everything in here, so I'm not really sure what that is. Huh. Uh, and there is one other thing that can affect the horizontal sweep. Uh, so when you see a bright vertical line, there's two possibilities. One, it could be a blip getting into the video signal that uh, is in the same spot on every scan line. That's a little unlikely. What's more likely is that the horizontal scan is not linear. It should just be, well, it's magnetic, but just pretend it's a, a voltage sawtooth. It should just be a linear ramp, and it just moves the beam at a perfect uniform rate across. But if there's ringing, or if that 
sawtooth has a distortion in it, it means that the electron beam is not moving at a uniform rate. Uh, so if it pauses a little bit longer in one spot, it's going to be brighter. If it's that same spot as it sweeps, uh, you'll see it again and again. Uh, so what's fairly common on sets is you'll see uh, a number of vertical lines varying in brightness on the left hand side. That's ringing. So when the electron beam kind of snaps back, the flyback action. Um, I'm simplifying things a little bit, but if there's ringing in the circuitry, you get scrunching up and spreading out of the electron beam and you get vertical lines. Well, one of the things that helps prevent that is this. There's a 47 picofarad cap actually mounted on the yoke. And that's also why they have resistors on the vertical windings. They're typically uh, 560 ohm, but I think these are 1.2K. Uh, I have not tested that. That is this guy right here. So I can check that cap. It's unusual for them to go bad, but you know, Sherlock Holmes would say, once you've eliminated the obvious, whatever's left, no matter how implausible, must be the answer. And there is one final thing. I went back and reviewed the video uh, I made a while ago, quite a while ago on this set, when I was monkeying around with the filament dropper. And what I ended up leaving in here was what I had come up with back then, which was to use uh, a diode. If you recall, there are two filament strings in this set, both 300 milliamps, and they join together with the pitcher tube, which is 600 milliamps. And there used to be two big old power resistors in here. I replaced those with, to di with diodes, two reasons. One, uh, to eliminate the heat, and two, line voltages now are higher. This was designed for 117, we typically have more like 125 now, so those resistors needed to be increased in value a bit anyways. However, with the circuit I ended up using, it was cutting the juice a little bit too much, so these tubes are running a little bit lean. Not much, probably instead of 300 milliamps, there's like 290. 285 but that might be enough to affect the gain a little bit that's why I'm not too concerned about the gain right now I'm more concerned about why is the horizontal so wacky and so touchy um, so we got a few things to do uh, for sure that and uh, check those resistors in them let's see there are some revisions of this oh and then by the way I did check to see how this uh, filter cap on the high voltage is wired up. Uh, it looks like it was chained at some point. Uh, this point here where they show two possibilities, the dashed line and then the solid line. That joint looks like it was resoldered. It doesn't have that uh, red uh, varnish on it. It looks like it's somebody, um, maybe they swapped it out or something. But it is now in the configuration with the solid line, so you do not need these dashed lines. So they very well may have replaced this cap or rewired it. Um, or sorry, they definitely rewired it, whether the cap's original or not, I don't know. Um, but they very, very well have clipped out uh, some of these parts, uh, that cap and that resistor, and that's why those lugs are, have those stubs of wire on them. So here's that cap. It's, it's well, I just can't tell if I'm looking at it if it's original or not. Um... Well, you know what? Now that I'm looking at this, that's a pretty crappy job. <laughs> so this may very well have been replaced. Those, um, you know, as bad as, it, as this thing is, or as tough as it is to work on, generally the solder joints were pretty well done. Um, but those look rather sloppy. And if they replaced this cap, they would have very likely... I've replaced, or have undone these wires, or then maybe they replaced this tube socket as well. There might have been arcing in it or something. This tube also look isn't isn't looking so hot, but uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. So what are we gonna do? Um, I suppose, although it's a pain, I should just do one thing at a time so I can see of what actually was the cure. Um, so for sure clip this out I'm going to test it as well to see if it's bad 
uh, power to set back up. If it still has a problem, I'll replace these tubes one at a time and see if anything makes any difference. Typically, even if it's good, if you replace this with another one that's brand new, you're going to have to tweak these adjustments a little bit because this is all kind of critical stuff. This whole, all this stuff needs to work in concert at maximum efficiency. And to get that, you want the least amount of current going through this tube that generally gives you the best linearity and the best brightness. And to do that, boy, there's four coils. You've got the ringing coil, you've got the oscillator coil, you got the linearity and width and the, and the drive capacitor. So there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there. So it turned out that this capacitor was half the value on the schematic. So maybe that makes sense that if the resistors were half the stated value that the cap would be two. So you get about the same RC combination. Anyways, um, was it bad? A little bit on the highest range, so like 500 volts on my tester was a little bit leaky. Replaced it. Did it make any difference? Nope. I am going to try adjusting these two controls now and see if they do much of anything. I uh, still have really bad vertical rolling, um, so let's try to ignore that as best we can. I just want to see if that vertical line changes at all. Not really. Let's try the other coil. Nope. I'm going to tweak that uh, ringing coil now to show you what I mean about how I can make it worse, but I can't make it any better. Now, it's possible that coil's bad. I sure hope it isn't, because... Uh, could be hard to replace. Uh, I also could try shorting it out, which is uh, what the, part of the procedure to uh, adjust it in the first place is to short it out. So now I'm cranking it out. Now this is another vertical line that kind of appeared, and now there's another one. Especially as I back this out, things get worse and worse. And I'm going back the other way. So it basically it bottoms out and we get horizontal sync, but we still have one really bright line and one faint line. All right, I will try swapping out the tubes next, and, uh, and there's still that mica cap on the yoke to try. Replaced both tubes, and I think there's a slight improvement. But uh, obviously there's still a very bright vertical line there, so the hunt continues. Next up I will check that mica cap on the yoke. That mica cap tests just fine, so now what? Well, now we're going to go back to the drawing board and test some waveforms. Particular, well, we will start right here. We should have a 50 volt peak to peak waveform that looks like that. Got a few other points we can check too. Got to be careful in this area though, because uh, get to this, it's like 900 volts peak to peak. Uh, you could fry some scopes with a voltage that high. In fact, with the version I've got, it's actually 1300. Yeah, my scope can't uh, <laughs> can't do that so we will be avoiding that point but there's a few other things we can check in particular I really want to check that because if that's got a kink in it that could certainly account for it and uh, let's see checking this point should be pretty useful checking these points should be pretty useful too if we see any any spikes any ripple kind of like you see on that in these signals that could definitely be the problem. Something else I can do while I got the scope on there is actually adjust those coils on the back to get the proper waveform. They don't show it here, I don't think, but in the SAMs for the very similar version of this chassis, 
they show what the waveforms are supposed to look like around here. Uh, well, yeah, okay, basically that. And when you adjust those coils, it changes these tips. You want to adjust those coils so that these tips are equal height. Got the scope out now, and I'm not entirely happy with what I'm seeing. First point I'm looking at is right here. I should have 50 volts peak to peak sawtooth. That's not so bad. Uh, it's more like 80 volts peak to peak. But there is a little bit of distortion down here. Which could translate to folding in the sweep and could make those bright lines. But it's pretty... it's not that much. Alright, so then I went back a bit and started looking at some of these other test points. Particular point 4 and 5 on the horizontal oscillator too. That's where things get pretty funky. A little hard to get at. Uh, let's see, oh, one, two, three. This guy should be pin four. So, the sh overall shape is kind of correct. It should look like that. And we've got that. What's different is the ringing is profound. It's going way off the bottom. This is the maximum scope voltage range I've got this on, which is 800 volts full scale when it's going off the bottom. Uh, that's kind of crazy. Uh, they're saying it should be 100 volts top to bottom, not 800. All right, so let's take a look at pin 5. That's the only other way from they've shown that immediate area, which should look something like that. Now they do say through a 1 mega ohm resistor. Um, this modern scope, I expect, is higher impedance than the old one. This being a 10 meg probe. At least I believe that's the impedance, so I'm not real concerned about that. So, that is supposed to look like that, and it does not. <laughs> So, I think there's something up with this. There is one other point we can check, I just noticed, which is that point, which is where the two coils join up, the frequency adjust and the oscillator adjust. And it should look like that and be 100 volts, 50 volts peak to peak. So, those two coils, sorry for the awkward camera work. Here are the two coils. Now, that is one thing I haven't checked, is there could be a problem with the coils. I've been avoiding that possibility because, well, uh, replacements may be impossible to come by. Alright, now of all the waveforms, this one actually looks pretty close to being right. So we are at this point right here between the two coils. 130 volts peak to peak looking like that and we've got this at about 150 volts peak to peak and uh, as I mentioned earlier I think those coils are supposed to be adjusted so that those are equal peaks on top and that's probably why it's not locking very well so let's grab a tool and tweak that bottom coil that's the one that's all the way in and start backing it out and see what happens to the waveform as we do that. That's getting to be in the correct shape. So that looks like it's supposed to. Except when I do that, the, uh, the lock was impossible to get. But that's good because that means that the oscillator is working 
So perhaps we're right back to where we were earlier, where the problem is not the horizontal or vertical oscillators, it's the sink, because the sink pulse is weak. Let's take a look at that again. So, for example, pin 3 on the sink clipper should be 30 volts peak to peak. I don't know if they don't show the time base, so I don't know if that's what the horizontal or vertical peak, but we can check both. I suspect that is the vertical peak on, I think that's pin 1, and those little dash marks are the horizontal sink pulses, but I'm not positive about that. So here's pin 3 on that tube, and we're looking at maybe 15 volts. And they're saying it should be 30, so it's half of what it should be. So if the sync pulses are way low, that would account for the horizontal and vertical holds being terrible and touchy and a pain. I'm pretty sure these are the horizontal peaks. We can tell that by doing the frequency. 15.75. So yeah, these are the horizontal pulses. And if I was to decrease the time base kind of hard to see but in there <laughs> are the vertical pulses anyways <sighs> so right back where we were unfortunately they don't show the input to the sync amp they just show the sync clipper signals so only one other thing we haven't looked at which I think is pin 1 where it should be 40 volts Yeah, so this is, uh, it varies, I believe, with, I'm pretty sure, with the content. That's what the clipper does. It amplifies the signal to the point where the, the signal is getting clipped. So you get kind of a uniform output level. So it makes sense that the input, so the input to the sync amp is, well, after the detector. Um, so they're basically picking off the signal going to, well, the picture tube. So of course it's going to vary with the uh, received signal. So that would be the video content and these are the horizontal sync pulses. Now they shouldn't vary too much. It's the con picture content that varies, but there's some AGC action which can affect it. So those squiggles there, that is the actual image content, the amplitude modulated. So we are, well it's varying a bit, but mostly it's around 8 volts peak to peak, which is, well, a far cry from 40. That'd be the vertical sink kind of mucking in there. Video signals are not the easiest thing to look at on a scope. <laughs> There are uh, video modes in this thing, on this thing, I believe. And they got the TV mode here, but I've never really quite, well, I haven't read the manual, <laughs> to be honest. But at any rate, it's not too, you don't, need to, you don't need to read the manual to know that the signal level is too low. So 5 volts per division, mostly we're around 10 volts, 8 volts, occasionally gets a little bit larger. But at that point, it's supposed to be 40. Now that's after the sync amp, so let's take a look at the input to the sync amp. There's pin 4. there is the input to the sync amp. So you can see pretty clearly that the sync amp, being a triode and the way it's configured, inverts the signal. So at this point the sync pulses are negative. And five, half a volt per division, so the tube is amplifying it, but it's going from like one and a half volts to ten volts. 
I don't know how much, it's kind of annoying because they don't tell me what the input to that amp is, so I don't know how much gain we should expect. I've checked these voltages and components associated with this amp before, and everything seemed to be fine. I will check it again. I've already swapped out that tube. Um, so we may just be back to it being an alignment issue, unfortunately. Uh, I've read the instructions several times. This is not an easy set to align, so that's why I've kind of been holding off on doing that, but I may just have to bite the bullet and give it a try. Okay, time to quit fooling around. Let's get the scope on pin 6 plate of the second video amp, that is one half of the 12 AU7 twin triode that forms the first and second video amp should be approximately 50 volts peak to peak. Well, I've already got my scope on that pin. Contrast wide open, which is maximum gain. And we've got about 25 volts, about half of what it should be. And if I back off the contrast a little bit, it drops off fast. By the time I get to it down about 15%, maybe 20% on the control, there's nothing. And I'd noted that early on when we first started seeing an image that I didn't have the contrast all the way up or we didn't get anything. And now this is with seemingly the horizontal adjustment coils uh, adjusted correctly as per the scope so that the waveform looked right. And I cannot get a horizontal sync. That's as good as it gets, which is terrible. And of course the... Uh, Vertical is horrible. I'm going to turn the brightness down a little bit so it's a little bit more viewable. I'm adjusting the vertical uh, hold, trying to get something close to watchable. And, well, just now. So we are definitely lacking gain. So let's go one stage back. The grid. Uh, the first video amp should have approximately 2 volts, that's on pin 2, so I will move the scope over to that point and let's see what we got. Well this is interesting, with the contrast maxed out, we've actually got about 6 volts peak to peak, it's 2 volts per division right now. And if I back the contrast off a bit, to where it's down to about 2 volts per division, uh, I'm at about 80% of the contrast. So, what does that mean? It seems like if I put 2 volts peak to peak on pin 2, I certainly do not have 50 volts peak to peak on pin 6. So, let's do a couple things. Uh, I'll just double check those resistor values, the 3.3K, the 2.2 mag, the 4.7K, the 10K, and the plate and cathode voltages should be 12.5, 100 volts, 14 volts, and 225. And lastly, the coupling capacitor. Well, I checked all the components and everything was pretty close. The voltage on the plate and cathode of the first amp though is a little low, but the associated components are dead on, and the main uh, B plus rail is like dead on, so I'm not quite sure what's up with that. But what I did do was I tested the 12AU7, um, and it's a little weak. And as you can see, uh, I put a different one in. I haven't tested it yet, but I just wanted to quickly see if it make any difference. It's better. The picture quality is actually really good, but the sync is still very touchy, and I had to readjust the horizontal coil to be what it was before, where one is all the way in, and the other one is almost all the way out, and vertical hold is incredibly touchy. You just kind of breathe on it, and it, it loses it, so... Problem not solved yet, but I haven't tested that tube yet. What I do have is a different 12AU7 in the tester right now. 
I don't think I have any new old stock 12 AU7s on hand. Uh, and this one's kind of marginal. So I will keep digging uh, and try to find one that tests well into the good and see if the problem is just as simple as that. <laughs> that I have been using marginal 12 AU7s. If that's all it comes down to, I'm going to kind of kick myself. However, I'd, I'm skeptical of that because of those horizontal controls being adjusted the way they were when I got the set. Um, you shouldn't have, uh, even if the signal's weak, uh, the control shouldn't have to be at extremes to uh, get the horizontal oscillator in the right range. So, still not sure about that. I went through about half a dozen 12 AU7s and picked the best one. It's strong on both sections. It improved things a bit, but it's still got to really the same issues. If the contrast is maxed, I go down a little bit and it's just gone. Touch the vertical control and it just loses lock quite easily. So, now what? I mean, we know that on the grid of the first video amp we've got, we can get easily 2 volts all the way up to 6 volts. And it's 6 volts on that grid. The plate here, well, granted it was a different tube, so I should recheck it. Uh, but we only had 25 volts there. Hmm. Uh, I can check these peaking coils again. That's what these... Inductors are here. They all had continuity. They could have a shorter turn. I don't know how much of a difference that really makes. Uh, and there's one other thing I can try. So I re-engineered the filament droppers. And the circuit I've got in there right now is running the tubes a little bit lean. Although I do have... Uh, i got the set running at 120 volts right now. Uh, and I designed it so at like 125 they'd be running a little lean, so they're... Uh, but I mean, we got plenty of high voltage, a nice bright picture, the sound is pretty good. But anyways, um, what I'm thinking is I will... Uh, if I can dig them up, I'll put in the glow bars that, uh, that came with this back into it. Uh, otherwise, I'll dig up some power resistors and cobble something together, or uh, motor run caps. Just, in other words, a different filament dropper to uh, um, see if that makes any difference. I think I found the source of the vertical hold problem. What do you know it? There's a vertical hold control. What is it, Occam's Razor, I think, that the simplest explanation is usually the correct one. Now, there's two reasons why I didn't immediately check this control. One, it seemed to be doing something. I could adjust it, and I could kind of get the hold to work, and it would roll as I went to either side of a certain point, which is how a cold control normally works. Two, if it is bad, uh, what do you do about it? 100, it's a 100K potentiometer. That's nothing unusual, but to get a dual one with this shaft length, and this type of shaft for the knobs that this set uses is going to be a really, really, really hard thing to track down. But perhaps it can be cleaned, perhaps it can be repaired. Now this is the type, at least this upper one, which is the vertical hold, is, looks to be pretty well sealed, so I can't really get any, uh, yeah, but it looks like both sides. So the inner shaft is the horizontal hold, and the outer is the vertical hold. And they both seem to be pretty well sealed, so I'll have to pry up these tabs and dissect the control and see what I can make of it. Uh, and uh, I'll think about it, this is the... I guess I've only restored two GE, or three, three GE TVs at this point, this being the third one. All of them had bad controls. The GE810 seemed to work at first, but then uh, the hold on that one and other controls just went to hell, and I opened it up. And I think on that set, I destroyed the controls because I used Deoxid D5, which is for metal on metal contacts, not potentiometers. And the carbon tracks kind of just disintegrated on it. The other one being the GE coaxial, 
miracle with that set is I went through my stash and I had a new old stock replacement for like the power volume control I think it was this set uh, I don't know these knobs I, I fear may be fairly unique to this set now the inner shaft uh, is slotted so if I got one that was a like a, a full round or half round, I could hacksaw maybe a slot into it. The outer one, I don't know. But let's worry about that when we've completely eliminated every other possibility. So I have the control at one extreme right now. And you can see on the ohm meter there, it's going to just be going all over the place. It should smoothly go from zero, or at least a very low reading, to 100K. And what happens is... It jumps up right away to 100k, and it kind of stays around there, with occasional jumps to other values. As I'm rotating this, I'm still at a, I'm back at 100k, 100k, I'm about three quarters of the way rotating it, 100k, and done. So what that seems to me is happening is the center wiper is not making contact. They, there's three lugs here. The two outer lugs are the opposite extremes of the resistive element. So inside here, there's going to be a carbon element with two lugs. It's basically a 100K resistor. And there's a center wiper that wipes along it, going from one side to the other. So it should go from 0 ohms to 100K. They tied two of these together. So when I measure the outside, it should go 0 to 100. So I think that center wiper is not making contact. Um, which is good because that is most likely to be the easiest thing to fix. If I was measuring that this was open or really high resistance, that might mean the carbon track was damaged. That's more difficult to repair. Now the other issue has been the contrast, which kind of goes like 80% 80 per, 80 or so of its travel, the screen is just black. And then suddenly it jumps up. And then it's kind of wonky for the last 20% with being over so, too much contrast, not enough. Now that I put the scope on uh, the 12AU7, uh, let's see, where are the waveforms here? Uh, and I put a good 12AU7 in there. I've now seen that actually I do have um, pretty good gain. And the signals here are good. So... Uh, one problem was the 12AU7 I had in there was a bit weak. Uh, the other was the contrast control. I think is might might be uh, might have a similar problem to this control. Contrast control controls the gain on the RF amp inside the tuner and the first IF tube. It varies the voltage on the grid, which in effect varies the gain. So I think the oh, and then there's the horizontal issue, which. You know, I don't like having those uh, variable uh, inductors, the flywheel uh, coil with the slug at one extreme, but when I do that, it does actually work pretty well. Uh, the horizontal hold uh, holds solid. So, uh, anyways, let's see uh, what's up with this. It turns out that the CRT support that was in the way of these pots, uh, you can take it off. So with that out of the way, I was uh, able to, uh, I took the, the two uh, nuts off the, the controls and I was able then to just lift them up so they're still wired into the set. Um, so uh, one thing I can do right now is just leave these floating and dig up another 100k pot and attach it to these two points, power the setup, and see if the uh, hold then works and then see about, uh, to dissect it, I'll take all the wires off and take it out. That's why I kind of want to see if it works before I go to all that trouble. I want to see if we get some solid uh, vertical hold after I do all that. I rigged up a 200k pot, the closest thing I had handy. And it seems to have done the trick. It's still um, a little touchy, but so it's rolling one way and then... It's not too hard to get it to lock. And if I turn it a little more, it starts rolling the other way. But there. Uh, so here's the contrast control. So there's all the way at one extreme. And then as I back it off, just a little bit. Locks. And back it off a little more. It's watchable. 
and a little more and it's gone. And that still leaves about 80% of the travel on the contrast control. I don't think it should have that limited a range. And of course we still have that vertical line. Maybe the two are related, I'm not sure. Um, nothing I've tried has done anything to fix that, that line. Uh, I'm curious to try this with a full-size CRT, too, although I don't really think that'll make any difference. Um, at least we, it would be larger and maybe uh, see more detail about what's actually going on. So obviously we just saw it roll a bit there. Now I don't have any frame of reference to know how good the vertical hold worked on this set to be, you know, this model to begin with. But definitely where the contrast is set has a big impact on how well the hold controls both vertical and horizontal work. Contrast controls the gain. And that signal not only goes to the pitcher, but it also goes to the sync circuits. So as I increase the gain, I'm increasing the voltage to the synchronization circuits. And when I have the contrast up really high, uh, I think it's putting excessive signal on the hold circuits. So obviously we lose horizontal there when I put the contrast up really high. Now I can get it back. But now I think if I back off the contrast a little, we just start to lose sync again. And this control sh Really, well, at least it's been my experience with most models of vintage TVs. The controls aren't quite that touchy, but this is uh, definitely very promising. So next up, I'm going to check the contrast control and then start dissecting the vertical control, the vertical hold, I should say.